Okay, so in this video, we are going to cover the so-called Rolle's theorem. As you will see, it is a very intuitive theorem, and what we know from the extreme value theorem and about optimization, this will be a very easy theorem to prove. So here's a statement of the theorem. So we have a function, so let f of x be continuous on the closed and bounded interval a, b. So a and b are fixed real numbers, and a is less than b. So we assume f of x is continuous on the closed and bounded interval a, b. And assume it is differentiable On now the open interval a b so we exclude a and b from our interval and of course we say that f is differentiable if the derivative inside of a b exists everywhere so these are the assumptions so f of x is continuous on the closed and bounded interval a b and also differentiable on the open interval a b one last condition, if f of a equals f of b equals zero, and it doesn't have to be zero, but this will just simplify the argument in the proof, as long as f of a equals f of b, the result still holds, but we'll go with the special case where both f of a and f of b are zero, and this will simplify a little bit the argument. So if f of a equals f of b is equal to 0, then there exists a point, and we'll see that there may be more than just one point, but there's at least one. So there exists a point, say c, that belongs to the interval, the open interval a, b, such that, quite simply, the derivative of the function at this point is equal to 0. So f prime at c is equal to 0. And this is Rolle's theorem. So again, we have three assumptions. f of x is continuous on the interval from a, b, closed and bounded. f of x is also differentiable on the open interval a, b and we assume that the value of f at x equals a and b is the same, and that value is zero, then this is the conclusion of the result, that there must exist a point c in the interval a, b such that the derivative at c is equal to zero. So at the value x equals c, the curve is flat. Before we prove Rowe's theorem, and as I've said before, the proof will be very short, Let's just draw a few examples of a function on a to b where f of a and f of b are both equal to zero and see why the result is very obvious, at least intuitively, and this will motivate the proof, a more rigorous proof of the result. So we have our xy plane. And just for argument's sake, we'll assume that a and b are both positive. So suppose that this is x equals a, x equals b. And I will draw a function that is continuous, so there is no break in the function on this interval. And because the function is differentiable, it's a smooth function everywhere. And f of a is 0, and f of b is 0. And I'll draw a function that is smooth starting from the point a0, b0. You could draw any kind of particular function. And you notice that in this case there are two points where the derivative is 0. Right? This could be a choice of c. At this point, the function attains its absolute maximum and 
the tangent line is horizontal, therefore at this point the curve is flat, the derivative is zero. So this would be a possible value of c, but there's also this point which could also be a possible value of c. At this point the function attains what we can see as the absolute minimum. The tangent line is also horizontal at this point, and so the curve is flat, the derivative is zero. So at both the absolute maximum of our function and at the absolute minimum, the derivative is equal to zero in each case. So you see the result does not say that the point C is unique. There could be more than one point, more than one point, sorry, where the derivative would be equal to zero. What's interesting is that it seems that we're getting a feeling for it. One instance where the derivative was zero was at the absolute maximum. Another instance was at an absolute minimum. And you say, well, is it always the case? As it turns out, it actually is. Let's draw one more picture. And we'll look at an example where there are three points where the derivative of f is equal to zero. Again, this is x equals a, f of a is zero, x equals b, f of b is zero. The function could look something like this. It's a continuous function, it's differentiable, it's smooth. And now if you notice, there are several points where the derivative is zero. This point right here, you have a horizontal tangent line. The derivative, therefore, is zero at this point. At this point, another possible value of c, the derivative is also zero because you have a horizontal tangent line. Another point would be this one. Again, the tangent line is horizontal, the slope is zero, the derivative is zero. Here's one more point where the derivative is zero. The slope of the tangent line is zero. You have a horizontal line. And finally, one more possible value of c, where again, the derivative is zero since the tangent line is horizontal and has a slope of zero. And what do you notice about every single point where the derivative was zero. They're all either local maximums or minimums. This point here is a local minimum. This is a local maximum. This is a local minimum, local maximum, which happens to be at the same time a global maximum. And this is also a local minimum, which happens to be a global minimum. So it seems that the point C where the derivative is zero will have to be a local max or a local min. And this will motivate the proof. So now we're ready to go. We can prove that Rho's theorem is true. And we know where to look for the value of C where the derivative will be equal to zero. We're gonna look for a local maximum or a local minimum. Well, there are two possibilities. There's case number one, where the function f of x could be constant. So f of x is constant, so f of x is equal to always the same value, but since we assume f of a and f of b were both equal to zero, then f of x equals zero for all values of x. So f of x is equal to zero for all values of x in the interval from a to b. But then, obviously, there is a point c where the derivative of the function is zero. If f of x is always zero, the function, the graph of the function is just a horizontal line, and everywhere between a and b, the slope is equal to zero. So f prime of c is equal to zero for all point c inside of the open interval a, b. So if f of x is constant, 
it's just a horizontal line y equals 0. At every point inside of the interval a, b, the derivative of a horizontal line is 0. And so we have just proved the theorem. c can be any point in between a and b. The derivative at c is 0. So we're done. Case number 2 is the function is not constant. Well, think of it. f of a was equal to f of b, which was equal to 0. So at the two endpoints of our interval, the value of the function is 0. Since we're saying that f of x is not constant, there must be a point other than a, b, where the function is not equal to 0. Well, either it is strictly positive or strictly negative. Let's assume that it is strictly positive. The argument for f of x being negative at one point is the exact same argument. So we can assume that f of x is positive for some point between a and b. So we can assume that f of x is bigger than 0 for some x inside of the interval a b open interval. Okay, so now we will use the extreme value theorem. Our function f of x was assumed to be continuous on a closed and bounded interval a b. Therefore we know that f of x will attain a maximum value inside the interval and since at some point f is positive we can find the point where f attains its largest possible value of x. But this will be an absolute maximum, and if you remember, we proved a theorem before where we said that if you have a function that is continuous on a closed and bounded interval, it can only attain an absolute maximum either at a left or right end point. This is clearly not the case because at the end points the function is equal to zero, but since we have at least one point where the function is positive, this is not our maximum value. So the maximum value must occur at a point inside the interval. And we have proved that the only way a function can attain a maximum value inside of an interval is at a critical point. At either a point where the derivative is 0 or the derivative is undefined. But we assume by assumption that f was differentiable on the open interval a, b. So the derivative is always defined. So the point where the function f attains its maximum value, say c, must be a critical point where the derivative is equal to 0. And this completes the proof. So by, now I write EVT for extreme value theorem, we know there exists a point C inside the open interval a, b, such that f of c is the maximum value of f. On the interval a, b, and we proved before that as I've just said a second ago, if the function f attains a maximum value inside of a point at a point inside of the interval, the point c must be a critical point because the derivative always exists. We know that the derivative of f at c must be equal to 0. So we have shown before. that since x equals c is our absolute maximum value, which occurs inside of a, b, c is a critical point. So we have shown before that, whenever this is the case, c must be a absolute uh, maximum, and so the derivative has to be equal to 0. 
C must be a critical point. And this proves Rho's theorem. So you see we already had done all the work. By the extreme value theorem, the function must attain a maximum value at some point inside the interval because clearly it wasn't at a and b because f at a and b was equal to zero but the function was positive at some point so the absolute maximum had to occur at an interior point of the interval and we have shown before that if a function attains a maximum value at an interior point of an interval it has to occur at a critical point so the derivative of f at c must be equal to zero and this proves Rho's theorem. In our next video, we will look at the so-called mean value theorem, which is a direct consequence of Rho's theorem.